her, her, um, part of her conclusion in her writing, which is obliged to be a view from the women's gallery. The lady with all her inventiveness, her innovations and her spotlights will be seen as forever wasting herself on peripheral matters. Her writings will be seen as peripheral because the self sitting in the women's gallery cannot represent the general collective I, Israeli man, who is the official representative of that which is primary in our lives. So what I wanna to do today is look at um, both some work that was written before uh, Amalia Kahana Carmon uh, wrote this and some that was written after as a way of thinking about the trajectory of women within the world of Hebrew literature and the way that um, women build on the voices that came before them in order to sort of establish themselves as part of this collective eye. Um, and I would say, especially in the world of poetry now, prose too, I would say, uh, women are very central to, um, to contemporary Hebrew literature. Uh, this isn't always well represented in translation. Uh, but um, I would say that women writers are probably the most, the, sorry, one second, that's my, uh, but that women writers are the most um, sort of important and influential in the world of Hebrew letters today, I, I would argue. Certainly in, in terms of poetry, one of the, some of the most important poetic movements in contemporary Israel are spearheaded um, by women. Um, and that'll be represented also a, a little bit later. So the, the first uh, poet I wanna look at is the poet Achel, um, who published, I put her last name in parentheses because nobody uses it. Uh, she published, she's like Cher. Uh, she has one name, Achel. And um, she, you can see she had a very short life like many, um, early uh, pioneers uh, or uh, immigrants to Palestine, Jewish immigrants to Palestine, uh, she died of tuberculosis. Uh, she was born in Russia. Uh, she came to Palestine at 19. She was an ideological immigrant as were most uh, Jewish immigrants to Palestine at that time. Uh, she began writing in Russian but switched to Hebrew. Um, and, and she really is on the cusp of um, this transition in which women began to break into the world of Hebrew poetry and to be published um, and recognized. Um, and this is uh, one example from her uh, corpus um, called Niv in Hebrew. Niv is a little bit hard to translate elegantly. It can mean expression. Um, it can mean idiom, <laughs> it can mean, it has like a lot of Hebrew words because Hebrew is sort of a vocabulary poor language. It has a lot of meanings. Um, in this translation, which I think is pretty good, it's uh, translated as a way of speaking. Um, and um, I'll just read it for you. And um, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, her particular style and language. Uh, and I would also encourage you as we go through the talk to sort of think about her as foundational for a lot of other writers, both women and men who came later. Um, a way of speaking. I know many fancy ways to speak, endless and elegant. They go mincing down the street, their glance is arrogant. My heart follows a mode of expression as innocent as a baby, as modest as dust. I know countless words, so I am silent. Do your ears perceive even though silence what my humble, even through silence, my humble expression? Will you guard it as a friend, as a brother, as a mother at her breast? Um, so the sort of characteristic thing that Rachel does, which she does in a lot of her poetry, is that uh, I, 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 what I would call this is a kind of sarcasm or irony. Um, is that she presents herself as a kind of innocent, a kind of know nothing. And you may recognize this as a kind of typical tactic that women have to use in the world in order to make their voice heard. Um, she claims a kind of innocence or a kind of ignorance 
uh, that the poem itself belies. So she says, you know, I know many fancy ways to speak and listen elegant. Um, and then she uses this line, they go mi mincing down the street. Um, and this is a, a, one example here of what I'm talking about, because this line is a reference to uh, a biblical text, Isaiah, um, in which he portrays the disloyal daughters of Zion as mincing. Um, the, and, and so what she's done here is to throw in an allusion to a biblical text. This is kind of her bona fides, right? She's showing the readers, the largely male readership. Um, by the way, there were very few readers of Hebrew in this period also, and they were mostly men. So she, she has a very small, mostly male readership. She knows that. She also knows that uh, biblical illusion is sort of um, the aesthetic price of entry into uh, the acceptable world of Hebrew poetry. And so she throws in a biblical illusion here uh, in a way, I think, just to show that she can, while at the same time saying that she's extremely innocent, right? My heart follows a mode of expression as innocent as a baby. Uh, do your ears perceive, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. Let me get back to where I was, okay. Um, okay, so do your ears perceive even through silence, my humble expression, will you guard? Um, and so she uses these kind of images of modesty or innocence, but at the same time, uh, demonstrating uh, her sophistication. Sorry, I'm not sharing anymore. I just realized, let me just share it again. Okay, um, so that's one tactic that she uses here. Um, and at the same time, I think she's showing the readers that are telling the readers that um, she actually is a sophisticated writer. Um, she does know the norms of Hebrew literature, literary aesthetics, uh, even if she chooses not to use them. Uh, and another characteristic that we see here in her poetry is uh, a kind of simplicity that was characteristic of her poetry. You can see that the poem in a way is very conversational. Um, it's relatively uh, easy to understand. Even if you don't pick up the biblical illusion, you can understand the poem. Uh, and that was very much in contrast to the uh, poetic norms of this period, which really valued this kind of florid, um, I would say overdone poetry that's, that's um, extremely uh, uh, wordy. Um, there was sort of a transition occurring at this period, but she was really on the cusp of it. She um, was a devotee of uh, Russian modernist movements and um, was uh, familiar with um, the norms of um, modernist European poetry, and she made use of that in a lot of ways before many people were doing that in Hebrew. Um, and so she's kind of a, a path breaker in, in many, many ways. Um, okay. The next poet I'd like to talk about, who is a path breaker in other ways, but who certainly could not have been who she was without Rachel and other uh, poets who came before her, including Leah Goldberg, is Yona Valach. Uh, also lived a short life. This is unfortunately a theme. A lot of these early women poets lived short lives. So did Dalia Ravikovich. Uh, Yona Valach, uh, she didn't die of tuberculosis though, because by that time they were antibiotic. She died of breast cancer, which she refused to treat. Um, uh, Yona Valach was kind of a wild child of um, Hebrew letters. Uh, she struggled with mental illness, also untreated. Uh, she died young of breast cancer, but sh she wrote very candidly about female sexuality, um, her own bisexuality. Um, she had a distinctly uh, feminist viewpoint, and she often pushed the boundaries of acceptability. Um, as you can see, one of the pictures I've included here there's a series of photos that were taken of her with this man wearing tefillin. It's a reference to a poem of hers um, called Tefillin, which is very um, sexual and uh, 
as you, as you might imagine, uh, uh, transgressive. Um, and this is an excerpt from one of her poems called Simply Hebrew. Um, and uh, she, she has another uh, poem called Hebrew is a Sex Maniac, just to give you a sense of her perspective. Um, but she plays here with <clears throat> the uh, fact that Hebrew is a gendered language, um, like many European languages. Uh, it's a gendered language, um, and she used that a lot in her poetry to play um, with uh, the ideas that she was interested in, um, including sexuality, um, but also obviously taking the idea of uh, gender in language and extrapolating a bit to gender in society. Um, and uh, I'll just read this excerpt for you. It's a much longer poem. She had a lot of long poems. Um, but what she's doing here is imagining the consequences to the psyche of the gendered hierarchy that's built into language. Uh, in other words, how does language shape our own gender and our notions of gender? And <laughs> you see she died in 1985 this is very early to be asking questions like this. This was long before Je Je Judith Butler um, developed her th theory about the performativity of gender, but that's really what Yona Valach was writing about. Um, so this is the excerpt. English has all the possibilities for gender. Every I, in effect, is every possibility of sex and every you feminine that's in parentheses because there it's the, um, feminine word for you, which can't really be translated into English, is you masculine. And every I is sexless. And there's no difference between you feminine and you masculine. And all things are it, not a man, not a woman. You don't have to think before referring to sex. Hebrew is a sex maniac. Hebrew discriminates against or in favor doesn't hold a grudge, grants privileges with an account longer than the exile. In the plural, the males have priority the great, with great subtlety and secrecy. In the singular, the opportunities are equal. Who says all hope is lost? Hebrew is a sex maniac. She wants to know who's speaking. Almost a vision, almost a picture. What's forbidden in the whole Torah? Or at least to see the sex. Um, the, the longer poem is even more explicit about the ways that language constructs gender um, and also encodes and entrenches uh, gendered hierarchies, right? The privileges that she's talking about when she writes that um, in the plurals, the males have priority. That's because if you have a group in Hebrew and it's all women, but one man, then you use male pronouns to address the group and describe the group. So um, she picks this out as a way that we learn, right? That we understand um, that uh, men are more important than women. <laughs> and uh, that that's the, that's the position that the culture adopts uh, through uh, the acculturation into language. Melissa, I have a question about that. Yeah. So how, I, I mean, besides the fact that that's the way the culture built, was built, I mean, how did that happen? It just seems so random. What do you mean? The way that- That, that if, the, if there's one well, male in the room that all of the vocabulary is- Well, the language masculine. was created by men. So was it was it like a like a grammatical? I guess yeah, that's a grammatical it's, rule. It's a grammatical rule. Okay. Yeah, it's that's... a grammatical rule. And and by the way, um, obviously this is a big problem uh, now. The fact that pronouns are gendered when more and more people identify as non-binary, right, and see that traditional genders as as somewhat confining, um, and. Uh, there are a lot of groups who work who are working now on like solutions and creating non-binary language for addressing people who don't uh, operate within the confines of traditional genders. 
There are also groups that are working on different scripts that incorporate both the feminine and masculine endings in public places where both women and men are being addressed. So typically, for example, if you go to Ben Gurion Airport, there's a sign that says Bukhima Bayim. That those are the masculine endings. That's by definition addressing men only, right? If there were a group of women, you would say Bukhot So, um, you know, and for many years, of course, this was accepted as the default. Mm -hmm. Just as, by the way, for many years, we've accepted in English that he is the default pronoun. Um, now, typically, it's it's customary to use they uh, to indicate that, even in scholarly work. I'm very careful not to use he as default, the default pronoun. So it's built into our language, too, just not maybe as obvious. But in any case, there are groups now that have created, I can't remember the name of the group, I follow them on social media, um, that created a script that incorporates both the masculine and feminine endings so that you can put up like a gender neutral message, say like in the airport, right? So it would say both, you could read it both as um, and therefore creates more inclusiveness for anyone, right, passing through that public space. What's so, the chance of that happening? <clears throat> Well, th there are a lot of public spaces where they've adopted these kinds of scripts. Oh, good. Uh, I think, obviously, like as with anything, it's a slow process of change. But I think that there's now like a lot more recognition that there need to be other options for this and that there is a kind of exclusion that is um, uh, 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 instrumentalized through language. Uh, and that that has that and that has co other consequences right much more far reaching consequences and it's interesting now because if you look at you know Valach's poems from you know the 70s and 80s uh she's really dealing with all of those issues um that you know didn't really come to the fore in Israeli society for much longer and she was not ostracized during her time, but she certainly became much more famous after her death. Um, but I, I, I always see her, you know, very, very frequently in Hebrew poetry, there's a whole genre of scholarship about uh, certain eras of Hebrew poetry as uh, poets as being prophets. There's books about this. I'm not kidding. The prophetic in Hebrew poetry and this and that. And to be honest, none of them were particularly prophetic if you compare them to Yonavalov. <laughs> she truly was a prophet of, of Hebrew poetry, um, but obviously just in a way that's not typically valued <laughs> in, in, in the world of, of scholarship or hasn't been previously. So is it like, like in English, like if you read a, like a, an article in a magazine or, um, you don't see it in the newspaper, but um, like a blog or something, like you'll see alternating references yeah. to right. he and she, like, especially like I, I notice a lot of this when you have text about children, when you're saying, you know, yes. mom says or dad says, or, or they'll reflect, instead of, they'll say the baby or the child, or they'll refer to the baby as a he, and then later in the same paragraph, they'll refer to as a her. So yeah, is by that... the way, but this this has actually in English, this actually has already been given an institutional solution. That's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, because some years ago, uh, one of the dictionaries uh, changed the definition, I think, of the word they to make it gender neutral as a pronoun. And many newspapers have changed their style guides to include they as a gender neutral pronoun that can be used in the singular. Um, and, and there are many newspapers and magazines that now use they. So I, I actually think that English is way ahead of, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's perfect, but is way ahead socially and culturally in terms of this, this particular issue about gender being encoded into language. Uh, way ahead of Israel. That's also typical. Israel's often a little bit behind on these social movements. Um, mm. So, yeah. But yeah, no, you're right, um, Lisa, that, that you know, alternating pronouns for a while, I think, was typical. But now I think that there's more recognition just of 
uh, the confining nature of gender in general that they has has become preferred, but it has been really um, in, institutionalized or encoded in language in a way because of these changes in you know uh, grammatical style guides and things like that. So I do professional writing as part of my job and, and we do editing of grants and everything. Yeah. So we can, I guess what you're saying is that we can adapt this freely. Is there anything, is there an article that you would recommend that we read um, that basically says like this new style, style guide? I think this is really important to- About English? I mean, I, I would yeah, just- To be Google able to freely I, use this, speak this way. I would just Google because I'm pretty sure that like, now the New York Times and like AP use they as a gender neutral singular pronoun. And I know, I think it was like Merriam Webster, one of the big dictionaries changed some years ago, maybe more than one. Um, so I, I think if you Google, you probably come up with, okay. with the, the, the kind of like, if you need evidence, right, to support. Well, just this week, if we're gonna change our style, I think it's yeah, good to, to yeah. No, I know there are style evidence. guides that have changed. And, and typically um, when I write, I, I've never had a copy editor, flag, copy editor flag me for it, at least in like scholarly journals. So. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, okay. The last poem I want to talk about is by um, a contemporary poet named Tila Kimi. Um, she just had a baby, actually. Uh, she, you can see she's a millennial. She was born in 1982. She's still writing. Um, she's actually a trained engineer, although I think she doesn't work as an engineer anymore. Um, but she's uh, published a, a short novel and book of poetry. Um, and her first book of poetry won the Bernstein Prize in Israel. She's also been affiliated with a movement, poetry, poetic movement in Israel called Ars Poetica, which, um, as I mentioned before, uh, that women have been really um, influential in contemporary Hebrew poetry. And this is one example of a group started by uh, a Yemenite Israeli poet named Adi Kassar and uh, it combines performance and poetry and was intended originally to showcase Mizrahi artists. Um, Tehila is half Mizrahi. And, um, but, it it, but it's in inclusive. So it includes um, Ashkenazi artists as well. Um, and uh, this is a poem uh, from a few years ago by Tehila called Give Me One Day. Uh, that references an earlier poem called One Moment by Natan Zach, who is one of the um, sort of foundational figures of Hebrew literature and Hebrew poetry. And that poem begins, one moment of silence, please. If you please, I would like to say something. And here you can see that she takes, she again, if we talk about elusiveness, here she's alluding now to an earlier poem um, by a leading figure of Hebrew poetry, uh, a canonical figure, um, taking his words and, and turning that male voice on its head, right? I would like to say something. And here you could say that she would like to say something. <laughs> um, and the poem goes, I want you to let me finish a sentence. Do not explain anything. I want you to shut up. For one whole day, do not speak about anything. Abstain from words. Silence will fall in the hallways of power. The IDF high command will also be quiet. Leaves will rustle outside the windows. I request one day of relative quiet on the borders and in the bus stations, without whistles on the way to the beach, without catcalls from car windows. Around kitchen tables, mothers will discuss politics. Girls will laugh at their sister's jokes. You will shut up. By the way, just as a side note, I gave a version of this talk once at Beth Yashurin to the sisterhood. And um, it was like a, a dinner, like installation thing. And I'll never forget because I will, I like to hold a grudge. The emeritus <laughs> rabbi was there. I can't remember his name, Siegel. Jack Siegel. Yeah. And he, while I was speaking, interrupted and said, 
ha 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 it sounds like something a woman who's uh mad at her husband would say or something like that he said that sounds very, like something that jack Siegel yeah would he say. said this very nasty thing and i sort of clapped back at him and then i they they i don't think they liked me very much after that but anyway <laughs> um uh it's anyway it, it was a sign to me of the degree to which this poem makes men uncomfortable um because it really insists on their silence it, and and it insists on not only on the silence of men but it insists on the voices of women because if you'll notice <laughs> the consequence of the silence that she's asking for uh is that mothers will discuss politics girls will laugh at their sisters jokes that women will get to speak um and to uh behave in the ways that they want to behave um in this moment of silence right um and to me this is just an elaboration on that line from zach i want to say something right this is what she wants to say in that silence this is what women would say um and I don't think it's an accident either that it's connected to um, military and political power. Uh, when I was talking before about Zionism and gender, of course, Zionism built the notion of the new Jew um, and the the Israel the ideal Israeli citizen uh, is a uh, militaristic. Um, as a soldier, right, the figure of the soldier, um, and uh, that is really central to this uh, self-conception um, of the Israeli man, but really the Israeli man becomes a stand-in for the Israeli citizen in general. And here I think um, Tila therefore is insisting on a, a reconceptualization of what it means to be uh, a citizen, an Israeli citizen, what it means to be an Israeli, and insisting on the inclusion of women and the inclusion of women's voices um, in that um, in that construction. Um, I think Israel, like um, of all countries, is there's such a conflict because on one hand you have women serving in the military and from you know, from the beginning. And yeah, then but they the serve hand, in extremely unequal conditions. They're, yeah, it's, well, it's, yeah, it's not the same. Well, I just wanted to, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I, I do agree with that. But I said, but also like compared that to um, like the orthodoxy, which is so. Yeah, so I, I mean, I haven't really touched on that because these poems are really more from the secular world. Mm -hmm. But actually, or I, I, I'm, I'm, um american jews have been infected by israeli hasbara that constructs israel as an egalitarian society when it is absolutely not mm. women are not given equal roles in the military they serve less time there's only i think one or two combat units uh there are very few combat soldiers combat units are the elite units and it has serious consequences for women in Israeli society because military service is the way that men advance after their military careers are over. The networks that are created in military service serve um, as stepping stones into the world of business, um, into the world of politics. Um, women are severely underrepresented in the Israeli Knesset, although it's much better this after this cycle um still really bad um and uh there's a lot of good scholarship about this Daphne Israeli in the 1980s did some sociological studies of women in the military that at least one of which is in English um and uh that documents the inequalities in military service that affect women's position in uh, Israeli society more generally there's also, as there is in the American military, by the way, and maybe in all militaries around the world, I don't know about this, but I can imagine a huge problem with sexual assault and harassment in the Israeli military. Several top military commanders in recent years 
have been credibly accused or um, convicted, uh, you know, within the court martial system of rape, assault, and harassment, um, which must mean that there are many, many more cases, right, that uh -huh. aren't documented. Um, obviously, we know that's a problem also in the American military. Um, so there are a lot of ways in which um, uh, the military um, has not been uh, an equalizing force in Israeli society and that you could even argue um, harms women. Um, there's a lot, uh, there's now a lot of work on this. Rella Mazzali is an activist has also written about this. Um, so I think, and now there's some, there's a lot of cultural representations now that are very interesting by women uh, about military service and, and the way that women um, are treated in the military or what women's lives are like in the military. So um, yeah, I, I, I find a lot of times when I talk about the Israeli military to American audiences, there's a perception that it's this very egalitarian institution and it is actively not that the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also a perception that um, because of the labor movement, the influence of the labor movement in Israel, that Israel has a somehow more egalitarian society. And that's also been documented to really not be the case. In fact, the labor movement itself was not an egalitarian movement. It was egalitarian in name only, like a lot of radical political movements. Um, I mean, right, the Soviet Union maybe is another example. Um, that claimed egalitarian values and then in practice had women, um, you know, working in kindergartens and the kitchen, basically, while men ran the, you know, kibbutzim. In Israel, it's the kibbutzim. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so there's, yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, and, I, and I would say that a lot of, uh, you know, the writing that we're looking at today, I think addresses some of the this in terms of language and literature, but it also you know refers to broader cultural trends that I think are important. That's why I mentioned the inclusion, um, you know, in a couple of ways in this poem of the military because I I think it's an intentional inclusion and a singling out of the Israeli military as a place um, that demands women's silence in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, I think it's also not an accident that there are a lot of, a lot of the peace movement in Israel is sort of organized by and run by women. <laughs> and there are a lot of specifically women's peace organizations, um, uh, as well. So, um, and even the ones that are not, um, specifically for women are often run by women. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's my uh... wow. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you, and I'm I'm so sorry that more people have yeah. I'm sorry have too. Have joined us. Yeah, yeah. We've had a few, Melissa, as as it's we've wound down for yeah. the season, and we've had the last two months like all those really gritty topics. Um, unfortunately, the attendance has really waned, but but. Joyce and I are, are, this is one of our topics. So <laughs> you- it, I was it, sitting it, here trying to think of who, who, who else should be here. I know, I know. And but it was hard is, to come up with some names. You really opened me up to this. I did, had no idea how this was going to go. And this last conversation about the military is fascinating to me. So I'm mm. really appreciative that you shared that. I had no idea. Mm. So thank you for this and yeah. thanks for listening to our little thank you. preview. Yeah, my pleasure. I, and I, it was a privilege to be in such a small group. Yeah, thank, <laughs> yeah. and thanks for coming to both of you. I appreciate your presence. It's amazing. Oh, so listen to this, Joyce. Um, so uh, I got the call that um, uh, this was like last year before the pandemic started that Gloria Steinem was going to be in Houston and I was like I am going to this. this she is like one of my heroes 
of, of, she's just one of my heroes. So Mm -hmm. when Larry and I got married, this all ties in, we decided that we would like to make a commitment to go to these concerts that represented our growing up, you know, like Billy Joel and, you know, Mm -hmm. all these people who we just did the classics. So when we kind of finished that, there's, there aren't any left (laughs) who we haven't (laughs) seen. I'm like, now I have to start going to these speakers. So that's my next thing. So when, when I saw Gloria Cinema, I got there an hour early. I was like third in line. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) (laughs) I was, I sat on the second row. I was just not going to miss it. Ah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So anyway, well, thanks, Melissa. Have a good day with your family. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you again. It was good, Lisa. Oh my God, Joyce. I was kind of worried in the beginning, but she was good. And I'm sure you noticed that when she had her name, she, in parentheses, she had she slash her. Yes, yes. I I don't know whether that is a... um, some uh, something that she wanted to do or something that the university wanted her to do because my granddaughter who one of my granddaughters works for indeed in austin Mm -hmm. and she when she uses her um indeed account you know on zoom she also says she her and i think that i indeed suggests that people do that as a way of wow clarifying their uh, wow yeah well that's not something i've delved into my own personal comfort zone but i have to say that if that's what's happening then that means a lot to me that the company is saying you know we're behind this this movement um i think it's i i'm as a matter of fact i'm going to zoom with her to, to this afternoon i'm going to ask her whether it's uh, the company wanted her to do that or she did decide yeah to. yeah yeah well it's i mean it's just something that we're it's another big change so like yep it's who who knows what the next in the meantime i also have found out that many many people are naming their babies these um generic names oh, you know like, like you. Jaden like, or Jaden yeah 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 where I you know can't boys tell and girls who are Jaden's. yeah it's like yeah. all these other like Ray you or know Morgan or something like exactly that. Morgan yeah so apparently this is a trend so thanks for the contribution okay. in Lily's Lily's honor oh well muscle tough to you I sent you a How's note to be a grandma? <laughs> we're getting used to it but it is <laughs> Fun. I mean, I, I, yeah, you can so I, wrote, it back. I wrote to you a very special note about that in my oh. card, but it's okay. like, you just look at them and you're like, you couldn't be more perfect than anything. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> it's like, where is this coming from? It's just like, you're just yeah, perfect. They are. They're wonderful. Yeah. And they get better as they get bigger. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I just was, it's nice to, uh, like, I see people who really, like my parents who really make a point to be part of the lives of the kids, and the grandchildren, because you just see like the special. Right. A bond. A sure. bond. Yeah. 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 So that's true. That's true. Anyway. Well, thanks for coming, Joyce. And okay, listen, of all the two people, I'm glad it was us. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. It was great fun. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.